What's up, Rent Retirement Community? Zach Lee Master here. I want to take a moment to show you how I was able to achieve a 100% ROI on a normal investment property just following the strategy about how I personally invest. As most of you should know, if you follow our stuff, I love running through the numbers and using, using actual case study examples to show you how to maximize your return on investment. And this is something that you can do to save you tens of thousands of dollars in potential taxes and other things that to, that you can then reinvest to help you scale your portfolio and dramatically increase your ROI. And this is just on normal investment properties. This is just about an example of how to be a strategic investor and how to think about how to maximize your returns. So let's get into this. This is a Alabama property that I recently purchased. This is a new construction property. As most of you know, I love new construction, especially in the Sun Belt where things are growing. Uh, this is just a normal bread and butter house, nothing unique. This isn't a unicorn investment. You will see that it's a pretty average type of investment that we offer at rent to retirement, but I want to show you the strategy on how you can save tens of thousands of dollars in taxes, increasing your ROI to a hundred percent or possibly even more. So, uh, this property I purchased at $275,000 rent was 1950 on it. Just a little bit about the house. I mean, normal, it's a nice home, right? This is an A class area, attracted quality tenants. It was leased at the time that I closed it and it started cash flowing for from day one. And we have plenty of properties that are already leased at closing. Uh, this is one thing I'll point out real quick, and this is relevant to what we're talking about today. On our new pro formas, we are showing a five and a 10 year projection. This is really important to look at the big picture of why we're investing. So many people come in and they're hyper focused on just cash flow or just uh, your ROI day one or year one. And it's really important to be, I think, before thinking about how you're really growing your net worth in rental real estate long-term focusing on all the ways that we earn income um, and grow our net worth through rental property investing. You should know that we apply the ideal investment formula here at Rental Retirement, and that is income depreciation, equity, um, equity buildup, appreciation, and then leverage. Those are all the ways you you grow your wealth over time. So um, on our pro we're showing five and 10 year projections so you can have an idea about where you're going to be net worth wise, equity and cash flow after multiple years of holding the property. And of course, if you want to go to our wealth tracker, you can click the link to our wealth tracker where you can actually punch in your own numbers. All right, let's dive into it. So this new construction property, this is a long-term rental. As I mentioned, it was rented at time of closing. The price point on it was 275 here. The rent on it was 1950, which is great. I used a 20% down payment, conventional financing. This is $55,000 down. My monthly net cash flow was 400, roughly $400, 407. This is after all tax insurance, you know, even taking out things for maintenance and vacancy and things like this. Now I was able to, because the builder was buying the rate down, I was able to get a five and a half percent interest rate. This is something that's still available. There's still many builders out there. They're offering rate buy downs. So I was able to get a five and a half percent interest rate on this property, which did help it cash flow much more um, versus what I would have otherwise in current rate environments. So let's go through and actually calculate the ROI on this. Um, and I love looking at the math of properties to understand like the full comprehensive math, not just looking at the cash flow like we talked about. Do not be an investor that only focuses on cash flow because that is really, you'll find as you become a more experienced investor, probably the least relevant thing that builds wealth over time. Now, cash flow is important. We want cash flow to support the property, but no one's looking to retire off of cash flow day one. At uh, $407 a month, take that times 12, that's you know 4884. And I took that divided by my down payment, which is 55,000 to get a cash on cash ROI of 8.8%. That's actually pretty good. I think the rate buy down to five and a half um, definitely saved me in interest I would otherwise pay and allowed me to have a little bit better return on investment just from a cash on cash return. But even if this was five or 6%, it's kind of, it's kind of irrelevant big picture as we look at these other things. Most newer investors, especially when they're looking at a pro forma, they stop there. They stop looking at their cash on cash. They look at their cash on cash ROI and they compare that to like stocks or, uh, you know, crypto, whatever, any other type of investment. But that's, that's kind of running your math inaccurately because the cool thing about real estate is all the other ways we build wealth in rental real estate through you know your appreciation, using leverage, your tax benefits and depreciation. All those have tangible real returns that you need to understand because that's how you, when you add all those returns together, that's how you compare apples to apples of other types of investments. 
Um, so my loan pay down, you know, I calculated an actual amortization schedule. And if you don't know how to do this or you don't know what that is, Google it. There's a simple calculator, your, your loan term, there's three inputs, you know, how much your loan amount is for, for the property, the term of the loan, usually it's 30 years if you're using conventional and your interest rate. And it'll tell you exactly how much principal you're paying down each payment. Every, every monthly payment you make, you pay more and more principal. And after the first year, I would have had a pay down on this property of almost three thousand dollars, twenty nine ninety, and so I divided that by my down payment again, fifty five thousand, and just by I was building equity in the property just by paying the loan down, which is the tenant is really paying for through rent, and that allowed for a five point four per percent return, and then my appreciation. This is something that is you know somewhat speculative. Um, all real estate goes up over time, regardless of short term fluctuations. You can use whatever number you want for appreciation projections. On average, we average about 9% per year uh, across the board with most of our investments, but people like to be conservative. So I put in a 4% appreciation rate on this area. I know that I'll do much better than this uh, being new construction in the Southeast. However, running appreciation at 4%, that is $11,000 of equity that I've built after just the first year. Remember appreciation compounds year after year, all these things compound, but I'm not even factoring in compound growth. I'm just looking at one year evaluation. So $11,000 divided by $55,000, that is a 20% return on investment, just at a conservative 4% appreciation. Guys, using leverage and appreciation is how you become very wealthy in rental real estate over time. And that's why it matters, the locations that you buy in. Cash flow is just there to support the investment and eventually live off of if you get to that point and as your properties continue to go up and cash flow as rents increase. Now, normal depreciation on this property, I ran, uh, and you're required to take depreciation. This is something that everyone takes and it offsets the passive income of your property. So this is why this cash on cash ROI would actually technically be higher than this because I'm not paying taxes on this money. This is basically equivalent to after tax dollars, but depreciation, I was able to get a 7% return on investment. And this is how a lot of people don't know how to factor in ROI for depreciation. So let me show you how to do that. And it varies for each person, right? This will vary based on what tax bracket you're in and things like this. So I took my, um, basically with depreciation, you remove the you remove the land value. Um, and it depends on where you invest. Most of the areas that we invest the land is very cheap. And so the majority of the improvement, the actual property, the building, you can depreciate. You can't depreciate land. So we took um, we did the actual land value in this case was about twenty thousand um, dollars, and we actually ran a report to see this, and so our improved improvement value is two fifty five. Now I took two fifty five divided by twenty seven and a half years because that's what the IRS applies for your depreciation schedule, and that means I get a nine thousand almost ninety three hundred dollars a year every single year for twenty seven and a half years that I am using as depreciation. So then I took that $9,300 and I times it by my tax bracket. So I'm in the highest tax bracket because like many real estate investors, we're making good money and reinvesting it. Uh, and we, we have taxes that we're subject to. This is a combination of my federal and state uh, tax bracket combined at 42%. And so I times the, the um, tax deduction that I get because this is reducing my income by $9,300 and I times it by 0.42 to get the actual, which is by combined tax bracket to get my actual physical cash savings. And that's what you need to calculate ROI. And so I saved almost $4,000 here, $3,900 that I would otherwise pay in taxes just through normal depreciation that everyone takes by buying this house. So I divided that by my down payment because remember you're to calculate ROI, it's always money received divided by money out the door or down payment or out of pocket costs uh, within one a one year time frame. That's how you're calculating ROI and it gives you a decimal point and then you times it by 100 and that gives you 7.1%. So I was able to actually save 7% just in normal depreciation. Guys, all of these things right here that we just factored in, that added up to a total percent a total ROI of 41.4% just in year one when you calculate all those things. But if I just focused on this 8% cash on cash ROI, it may not have seen, you seem to be like that crazy of a good investment. You really under need, need to understand how the math works in calculating your ROI for a property. And all of these things will go up exponentially over time 
as things have a compounding growth structure to them. Um, and so that's really important. This is just after year one. Now, what I did on my properties, because I'm a real estate professional and I work full-time in real estate, I did a cost segregation study. And I want to show you how this is able to just dramatically amplify your return on investment. And this is how I was able to achieve this 100% return on investment here. And I know what you're thinking if you're saying, hey, I'm, I, Zach, I'm not a real estate professional or I can't qualify for this, this is my first property. Stay tuned because I'm going to show you how one of my colleagues and also an investor with us did this exact same thing through following the short-term loophole well, they, where they also did accelerated depreciation without being a real estate professional. And I'll walk you through what those steps look like. And they were still able to achieve an 84% return on investment, not being a real estate professional. Uh, so just follow me here for a second and I'll show you how, regardless of your real estate background, even if you're a first time investor, you can be a savvy investor to dramatically increase your ROI, save more money that you'd otherwise pay in taxes to reinvest and help you reach your goals quicker, even without being a real estate professional, but still following the same strategy that we're helping many investors do. But let's look at the cost segregation for this sec for a second here. So I usually run my cost segregation around 30%. This property happened to come in exactly at 30% of the of the the purchase price or the improved value of the property. Quick back of the napkin math. Um, generally speaking, I would say 25% to 30% of the purchase price is a very acceptable number to use for cost segregation. That's your accelerated appreciation. And I will explain what that is and how it works. And I'll actually show you my cost segregation study that I ran on this property. But I was essentially able to have a $77,000 tax deduction this year, the same year that I bought the property, reducing my taxable income from any source, from our business, so the, one of the multiple businesses we own, from my wife's income, doesn't matter. I was able to reduce our taxable income by $77,000. And I wanna show you how to calculate this, all right? So $77,000 times our tax bracket, 0.42%, equals a real life tax savings of $33,000, almost $33,500 that I would have otherwise paid in taxes. Guys, this is a down payment for another house. This is almost equivalent, just the tax savings on this, this is almost equivalent to my $55,000 down payment. And there's ways that you can actually save more in taxes, like tangible money that you would have otherwise paid. You can save more than more than your down payment in taxes by doing the strategy. Then think about that, how powerful that could be. So $77,000 times my tax bracket equals $33,000 tax saving. Divide that by my $55,000 down payment times 100, that is a 59% ROI year one, just from accelerating the depreciation. And then what I did in addition to that, and of course, you know, if you really wanted to run true ROI, I would take this $33,000 and calculate the ROI that I would have received from reinvesting it. And your, your return just goes through the roof, right? This is technically an infinite return because this is the money that you saved and could reinvest that you would another, otherwise never had again. So then when you add up all these all these uh, ROI numbers together, which is your cash on cash ROI from cash flow, the normal depreciation, because keep in mind, you still get normal depreciation. However, it's at 70% instead of 30%. So it's slightly less, but you still get your normal depreciation over that 27 and a half years each year, in addition to my accelerated depreciation from doing a cost segregation study. And then I calculated my loan reduction and appreciation. All those things combined here added up over a hundred percent ROI. And I'm being very conservative on some of these things that are speculative, like appreciation, right? I mean, the depreciation that's tangible. You can physically calculate that the loan pay down that is tangible. That doesn't vary. That's that's set. You can pre-calculate all those numbers, the cash flow. We know what it was over the first year. So, I mean, even being speculative about appreciation, like a hundred percent ROI, this is extremely dramatic. Okay. Now, what I was talking about previously before we look at a cost segregation study is that there are ways where you can get into the three or 400% cash on cash ROI. And if you haven't heard about a way that you can put less than 20% down on a property like I did, uh, there are ways. So there are credit unions that we work with that, that can allow you to put, uh, you can buy up to five investment properties with as, as little as 5% down. You still have to qualify for those. You have to be in good financial position and have the down payment and the DTI requirements. But think about that. What if you put 5% down on this property and you still got all these same tax benefits? 
You know, you could literally be into the property for 5% down plus closing costs, but then save, you know, $33,000 on taxes when your down payment on the property is, you know, probably between five to $10,000. That alone, just, just by the depreciation alone is over 300% ROI. Now keep in mind, uh, and I did this exact strategy and I walked through it in another video, uh, keep in mind at 95% leverage on a property, it's probably not positive cash flow or positive very much. So your your cash flow would go down. Over time, it would increase as rents go up. But this is where you can really increase your tax savings if you are in a, a high income earner and you have a lot of tax exposure. Or you could simply put 20, 25% down, still cash flow on one property and still get tax benefits. But this is a unique way where you could really dramatically um, exponentially increase this. So let's go over here and talk about uh, my colleague who is not a real estate professional like I am, and but still wanted the tax benefits to be able to offset his income. There's a little bit of differences in how this works, but guys, there's a what's called a short-term loophole. Um, that's literally what I, people refer to it as, but it, it's a way where if you are self-managing your short-term rental, um, you're cons it's considered active business. And so you can take accelerated depreciation uh, if you're actually self-managing it and renting it out as a short-term basis during the year that you buy it. Um, and speaking with our multiple CEA or CPA network, we understand that if you're self-managing it and no one else is self-managing it, there's no more hour requirements. There's nothing that you have to meet. And if you want details on this, like let us show you that, you know, I'm not a CPA or attorney, but I, I have many good ones that I've consulted with about this strategy. And they've told us exactly the parameters to follow. But if you're self-managing a property, the first year that you buy it, that you put it into service, and you operate it as a short-term rental and you're self-managing it, there's no no levels of requirements you have to meet. You're not qualifying for RE Pro. You're self-managing an active business, and that allows you to take accelerated depreciation off of other income sources, uh, which other active income sources, not just passive income sources against the property itself, right? Anyone can run a cost segregation and take accelerated depreciation. Where it comes extremely powerful is where you can take your accelerated depreciation and offset your active income. So your income from your spouse, from your investments, from your active W-2 job, that's that's powerful. And if you're paying a significant amount of taxes, this is the easiest way to give yourself an immediate raise. All right, so for this short-term example, uh, my colleague bought pretty much the same exact property, but he tweaked his strategy a little bit. I had a long-term renter in place that rented from day one. He operated as a short-term rental property where he self-managed for that first year. And then he had the option after year one to turn it over to a property manager to continue to manage that property for him. But actually he found out that he enjoyed self-managing it and it wasn't terribly difficult to do, um, especially with the resources that we shared with him. And so he continued to operate it as a short-term rental. And in the beginning he didn't, you know, he wasn't super successful with the income because it takes a while to get going. But after he was self-managing it for six or seven months and he kind of got in a rhythm, year two, he killed it. He did way better than he would have done as a short-term rental. Also further increasing his ROI by generating better, uh, more income operating as a short-term rental. Once he got the hang of it and, and his systems in place and he didn't have to pay property management fees. So that increased his ROI. However, that first year, you know, he was learning and he didn't take it super seriously. He was mainly doing it for the tax benefits. And so we'll show that he had a reduced income operating as a short-term rental first year, but that didn't matter big picture. So anyways, same same type of thing here. He bought a property for 275. This is actually the long-term rent uh, on the property. I don't know, it averages, so we'll just put unknown here because we didn't know exactly what his average rent was. It was a short-term rental, and so it fluctuated time to time. His down payment, he put the same 20% down, but he also had to pay about $20,000 in furnishing cost that furnishing cost is also a tax deduction, right? So we need to consider that. So his net monthly cash flow, um, looking back over his first year of ownership, was about three hundred eighty-eight dollars net a month, which is less than I achieved as a long-term rental um, because he was learning how to operate it as a short-term rental, and I think it was just a kind of a side hustle for him. Um, but as as it, like I mentioned, as he learned how to operate it and he put more efficient systems in place. He, he's earning closer to, I think, seven or $800 a month now, um, average across the year. Because there are some seasonality. Some months you do really well, some are less. And then, but average, I think, is seven or $800 a month in rent that he's able to achieve. 
All right, let's look at what his year one ROI was operating this as a short term rental. So cash on cash ROI was slightly less than I was able to achieve just because he didn't achieve the same rent numbers. So taking that um, and also factoring in that he had more out of pocket costs because he furnished the house. So that is something you need to consider. So he had the same $55,000 down payment plus $20,000 down uh, in furnishing costs divided and divide his income for year number one into that. And that's a 6%. ROI. Again, not super attractive, especially for a short-term rental. However, that's not really the reason he bought this property. Also, most short-term rentals, actually, they take uh, two to three years to really optimize performance. You usually don't earn your optimal performance in year, year one simply because you need to get exposure. You start to get al algorithm um, favorability with uh, listings and things like this. The more activity you have on your rental, the more reviews you have having repeat guests, things like this, your your occupancy percentage goes up over time. So you would not expect your first year to be your your best year, usually about two, two to three years if you're taking it seriously. So cash on cash ROI is, as a short-term rental, 6%. Um, his loan pay down um, it was the same, the same loan pay down using the same loan structure. However, again, because we're dividing, we had more money out of pocket on this property due to furnishing. It, it cost him a little bit more and his ROI was slightly less. And same thing here, depreciation, same 4% using this. Um, his, his ROI was slightly less on this just because he had more out-of-pocket costs. Normal depreciation, we went through this calculation already, and you can see that that affects ROI as well. Now, here's, here's the other thing. His furnishing tax deduction, this is also a tax deduction because it's an out-of-pocket, it's a business expense, right? And so this is really important to look at. So his $20,000 that he spent on his out-of-pocket uh, furnishing costs times that by also living in the same state as me and being a high-income earner, same tax bracket, he saved $8,400. Um, he had an $8,400 tax deduction from his 20 k That's almost a 50% tax deduction, right, just on the furnishing. And then he times or divided that into his out-of-pocket costs, and that was 11% return on investment. So something kind of interesting to think about but all these things come into play. So once you factor all that together, his total year one ROI was just above 40%, 40 which is kind of the range where I was at as well, having him operate it as a self-manage it as a short-term rental. So he was able to run cost seg a cost segregation study on this property, do the same bonus depreciation because he's operating it as a short-term rental, and then he was able to increase his ROI dramatically. So actually running the same calculation here on his cost segregation study, he had a $77,000 deduction times by the tax bracket. That's the same savings we had, right? But he divided it by his $75,000 out-of-pocket cost, which was a 43%, and you add all of those up to an 80 for 84% ROI, cumulative ROI. And that's really, really important, you guys, because what, and by doing this, yes, he had to spend some more out-of-pocket costs, but he got that back in tax savings plus some, right? His tax savings was more than his furnishing cost. And now he had the furnished house that produces income. Now, at this point in time, produces more income than a long-term rental was. And he could have turned it over to a property, one of our property managers that manages short-term rentals. He could have managed, he could have had it as a furnished long-term rental that would have yielded higher rental income than, in, than an unfurnished long-term rental because there are demand for those. Um, but he chose to continue to self-manage it because we shared resources with him um, that allowed him to easily set up and self-manage his property. There's national furnishing companies. There's about two or three software programs that we provide our investors with. That is a quick reference cheat sheet, where if you say it takes you probably two to three hours to set up your short-term rental, once things are locked and loaded, it can be automated. So your pricing is dynamic. So the listings are being updated. If you didn't want to directly communicate with your guests, you could hire a VA or someone else to do that. While still, you're the one managing the property. They're actually working for you to allow you to do an accelerated depreciation. So this is extremely powerful, you guys. And this is something that we've been working with our investors on to have an accelerated depreciation and maximize their tax savings on their properties, even without being a real estate professional. And this is something that's really creative to do with brand new construction in a growing area where you can save a tremendous amount in taxes, dramatically grow your portfolio and net worth, um, and just reach your goals much faster. The one thing, I'll let's look at a cost segregation study because I, I forgot to do that previously. So this is an actual study. This is a 144-page document that you hire an engineer to actually produce for you, 
and they go through the entire document and they come up with all the things within the house that are listed as a five and 15 year depreciation. So these are typically things that are interior, your flooring, your paint, all the things in the, the improvements, the house structure that don't let last 27 and a half years. They, they extrapolate those, that out, that, that, those data points and those costs. And then with the bonus appreciation, you can take it in, in year one. And then the 15 year, you also, they, they take those lifespan and those are more like structural related items that are not going to last 27 and a half years. And then you can take that and add it to your five year and combine these two items to take in year one. That's called bonus depreciation. So taking these five and 15 year um, items in the house and then taking all that depreciation in year one, that's the bonus depreciation. Now, I ran all my numbers at 100% bonus depreciation. For 2023, it's at 80%. Over 2024, it's re reduced to 60% instead of 100% of this. You could take 80 or 60% of it in year one. Still a very dramatic impact. But right now, and hopefully by the time this is released, the Senate and will have passed the extension of the Tax Relief Act or Tax Relief Bill where they're actually extending 100% bonus depreciation all the way through 2025. And this is really impactful because this is going, this is what, this is all the real estate investors. If you talk to any real savvy investors or people that are successful in real estate, 100% of them are doing this because this is by far and away the most impactful thing you can do to save money, reinvest and grow your portfolio quicker and increase your ROI dramatically as we just showcased here. So this is extremely important and something that you should highly consider whether you're a real estate professional growing your portfolio, fantastic. Or if you are a high income earner and you wanna buy some new construction properties, maybe get a crash course on how to use it as a short term rental, see if that's something you like and wanna continue doing. But if not, you get dramatic tax benefits year one. Um, but I just wanted to show you what it cost segregation study looks like guys on houses like this, you know, cost seg study should be, you know, one to $2,000. It's really inexpensive on single family houses. Uh, and we have resources to share with you here. This came from our good boy, Steve Tressel, who is, uh, our, our recommended cost segregation specialist, but it's, a, it's a very long report. If you scroll down here to show you, they go through every item in the house and without getting dizzy here, hopefully we can get down here. So tons of pictures, but they actually go through and they list all the components in the house. And then they categorize it as 15 year. You got your five year summary and then the rest of the, you know, uh, 27 and a half year summary. So it kind of goes to show you exactly how much of the property that you can totally reduce. But anyways, guys, if you found this video helpful, and if this is something you're considering, reach out to our team, connect with us. We'd be happy to show you how you can dramatically increase your tax savings on some short-term rentals. And we also have a quick reference guide with all the tools and resources you need to get set up as self-managing. It's really not that difficult and it doesn't take considerable amount of time. Again, there's no time requirement that you have to dedicate to it if you're the only one self-managing it. So I challenge everyone to at the very least understand how to run these numbers to understand what a true ROI is by investing in rental real estate. If you need assistance with that, go to our website and then go to our wealth tracker under the education center tools and resources. Our wealth calculator will actually allow you to calculate this yourself for your properties. But if you want to run the long math the long way, cause it's easy to understand that way. I mean, that's a good option too, but I challenge everyone understand this and also think about ways that you could possibly you know, take accelerated depreciation on your property because that's how the wealthy people are, are doing it and growing their portfolios, uh, much quicker than they would otherwise myself included. All right, everyone hope this was beneficial. Thank you. Thanks for watching the rent to retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos like this one or this one here.